Hello YouTube, hello everyone, and please welcome back regular guest Ben. Hello! Ben, where are and you? <laughs> and James. Hello there, this is James Esprot, UJS 1978. And tonight we are discussing the Faceless Ones. The TARDIS materialises on the runway of Gatwick Airport. The Doctor, Ben, Polly and Jamie emerge to discover that they are in the path of an oncoming plane. They see a security officer coming for them, so they split up to flee him. Airport security confiscates the TARDIS after thinking the police are playing a practical joke on them. Polly ducks in the comedian tour's agency hangar, where she uh, sees Spencer kill another man and reports to his superior, uh, Captain Blade. Polly flees and runs into the Doctor and Jamie. After telling them what she saw, she brings them to the hangar. They examine the body, and uh, the doctor notes that the victim was electrocuted by a weapon that can't possibly exist on Earth at this time. They leave to find someone in authority, and Blade captures Polly without the doctor or Jamie noticing. He hides her along with the corpse before Jamie and the doctor return with sceptical airport authorities. Um... I'll um, skip to two things. One, my personal opinion of this serial is simply that I do find it wonderfully creepy. But I do also think that it's too long and the pacing is wrong. Uh, it just, it just, I do, do find it too slowly paced. Um, uh, what uh, pieces of, of uh, interesting trivia would be um, that... Uh, I, oh God, I've forgotten her name. Sorry, oh. you might just put that down. Um, thingy, the 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 dark-haired woman. Um, Sheila. Sheila Briggs. Yes. Right, I forget the name of the actress. Is it, um, but uh, she was supposed to be a companion. Yeah. Um, that was really? that was uh, telegraphed. That was bl that was <laughs> on and that was blasted on trumpets. That was a massive neon sign throughout the serial. <laughs> you know, my com the first time I saw this, my companion t sense was tingling so hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the actress who I'm just going to call her Pauline Collins because I can't remember her name. I think it's something like that. Um, uh, simply didn't didn't want to commit. She appears in the new series, which I think is the biggest gap in Doctor Who casting history. But what's interesting is, um, in the episode Tooth and Claw, the werewolf episode in the Tenant era, she plays none other than Queen Victoria. Oh, um, Holland, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, uh, and another fact is that one of the airport staff is Benedict Cumberbatch's mother. What? Yeah. True story. Whoa. Um, yes, Doctor Who really is the centre of the BBC, of, of the British film and television universe. <laughs> if... If there is an actor or director who hasn't worked on Doctor Who, then he has worked. He is related to someone who has worked on with, who has worked with someone who has worked on Doctor Who. <laughs> it is. It is one of those things. It's like that cop show, The Bill, yeah. that yeah. ran for, for for decades. My mother, my mother was a huge uh, theatre goer, and she always jokes that whenever you read a theatre program, um, every actor. Uh, you know, it'll say what they've been in, and everybody has been in the bill. Yeah. And quite often they've been in Doctor. Oh, the 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 weird thing about that is, is of course, that David Tennant, despite being Scottish, in fact Glaswegian, um, has never been in Taggart. He auditioned for Taggart, and he failed the audition. Yeah. Um, so you, you you never for bad yeah. in our American viewers, uh, Taggart is a Scottish Glaswegian detective show, uh, this, basically the Scottish Kojak or the Scottish Columbo, something like that. <laughs> Indeed, so so it, it's tragic because although um, uh, David Tennant was in the sitcom Rab C. Nesbit, as was Peter Capaldi. Um, David Tennant was never in Taggart, the only Scottish actor never in Taggart, so we never got to, uh, uh, to hear David Tennant say 
There's been a murder. <laughs> Um, but, uh, anyway, and, and, uh, it's 67. Oh. Sorry? If you don't mind, I can jump into this. This is the last Ben and Polly episode ever, and actually, yep. the way they interact with all the characters is really good. Well, when they're actually on screen, this, yes. this serial is the perfect example of the problem that has hindered uh, the series pretty much uh, pretty much since the beginning of uh, this uh, season of of Doctor Who ever since uh, well no e- even before Hartnell left the tenth planet with the uh, every the writers desperately struggling to think of something for Polly to do and then when like, later when Jamie came along something for Jamie and Polly to do. Uh, and then, <laughs> and then now finally something for Ben and Polly to do because it was assumed that Pauline Collins and Fraser Hines were going to be the new uh, double team, the the new double act of the companions, and it was it the, this this serial was basically just uh, Ben and keeping Ben and Polly out of the way until they said goodbye. <laughs> Um, I, I can shed some light on this, actually. Um, uh, Aniki Wills and Michael Crazy's contract ended two episodes into the serial. That sounds insane, but contract negotiations would have been dead. At, uh, Aniki Wills only wanted to stay in Doctor Who if Michael Craze did. Really? So you couldn't, yeah, so you couldn't have Polly without Ben. So literally, they're only under contract for the first two episodes. The uh, farewell scene in episode six was actually recorded when they were recording the first two episodes. Mm-hmm. Yes, really? Uh, it's, oh yes, that's that makes perfect sense. Well, most uh, things in film and TV are shot out of continuity. You know, it's, oh. it's it's very common to. F- to film uh, the end of the movie first, or the end of the TV series first, and then whatever, yeah. whatever's most convenient for the uh, shooting budget. But uh, no, it's it's not just that their contract ended early. As I say, they've been uh, they've been struggling to keep Ben and uh, they've been struggling to uh, find excuses for Ben and Polly. Or Jamie to not be there, to not be on screen, uh, ever since Hartnell, <laughs> ever since uh, the Tenth Planet. It, it, it is true that the producer at the time, Innes Lloyd, was not a fan of those characters. Mm. Oh, so, uh, it, uh, so he shares. Co- he, he's the uh, precursor of Koki, then, isn't he? <laughs> basically. Um, Oh, uh, but oh, and going back to the Macra Terra, yes, if you're brainwashed. Uh, you you lose your Cockney accent. We now know for a fact that if you are cloned by faceless aliens, you lose your Scottish accent as well. Yep. Yes, <laughs> the more, yes, I Again, <laughs> this is the ultimate example of the more evil you are, the more English you sound. <laughs> <laughs> or the more posh English you yeah, sound. Upper yeah, upper-class English, I should have yeah. said. <laughs> yeah, because... For viewers that haven't seen this one, basically Jamie gets turned into... Well, they have like a doppelganger Jamie, and the doppelganger Jamie sounds very posh. Well, not just posh, he sounds yeah. English instead of Scottish, yeah. yeah. Uh, sir. So, wrong country! Okay. <laughs> wrong country, Doctor! Where, and where, where do you live? I'm from a place called Scotland. <laughs> Seriously, couldn't we have heard Ben's clone? Please! Oh, it would have been so... You know, even after yeah. the Macra Terror, it would have been so, so hilarious. That's right, yeah. I'm a Cockney. Have <laughs> 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 you ever the pie and mash shop around here? <laughs> <laughs> that 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 would have been pretty awesome, yeah. Um, but uh, ah, well, uh, Ben, um, you so yes, yeah. Oh, uh, go ahead. Just as a random note, they revisited this idea in two thousand five. The idea of making mm-hmm. clones of people. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, the Santa, yeah, the Santa ones do it, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
straight out of the old uh, Second Doctor handbook. No, 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 and it's the uh, the Zygons do it first. In uh, oh, that's yeah. true. Yeah, the, the beginning of um, Todd Baker's. Uh, the, 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 the people talk about this. It's um, everybody mm. has to at some point do Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and actually mm. before Doctor Who, uh, the second Quatermass serial was actually basically a British Invasion of the Body Snatchers, um, and. Um, yeah, this is Doctor Who does Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, which it will do again. And the what science fiction experts talk about, uh, especially from this era, is it's the fear of, A, spies, especially sleepers. Mm-hmm. And who is the most effective sleeper? A sleeper who doesn't know they're a sleeper. And it's that idea that you could... Lit- you could know a spy, influence a spy, and not realise. So, uh, the, yeah, the invasion of the body snatchers f- type of fear is very kind of Cold War. Yes, um, exactly, which is another reason, uh, again, I'm always talking about the Daleks in this regard. It's another reason why, we, de- to the best of my knowledge, we don't see that much invasion of the body snatchers-esque fiction anymore. And when it does, like the like the Daleks in the new Doctor Who, some Tarans uh, creating clones. Let me guess, it was just, what, I've not seen that episode, let me guess, was it just a stupid comedy point? Was it just something to fill the time? Because, no, some Tarans are butchers, you know. It's not a Santaran unless it's torturing humans to death to see how long it takes them to die. <laughs> no, um, I was about to say with this episode though, um, it's actually the most logical episode I've ever seen because the Doctor lands on Hastro and the first thing that the guy does is like, "Hey, get those people in here." Questions them, doesn't believe a word of it. Says, "Please wait over here." That's the most logical Doctor Who episode I've ever seen. <laughs> If this was the mid '80s, they'd be like, "Oh, very interesting, Tom Baker. I very much like wh- what you have to say." <laughs> Versus Troughton era, where <laughs> the guy in charge is like, "I don't believe you. There are no space ray guns. There, I just don't yes. believe." Oh, oh which, which brings which brings us on to the next point: the fact that yes, the airport commandant is the uh, stereotypical trout and skeptic who refuse, you know, she, he is the uh, Mulder, if I remember, no, no, the Scully, if I remember, I can't remember which one's which. Uh, Scully is oh. the skeptic. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, the, the Scully, the person who wouldn't, wouldn't believe that aliens are eating people's faces if the two, if the monster, if the alien in question was actually chewing on her face at the time, you know, to right. which... Thankfully, in this serial, there are uh, there is the detective inspector played by the same actor who's been in about seventeen different Doctor Who's by this point, <laughs> most famously as Saladin, <laughs> who shuts yes. the twat mackerel up. Uh, th- th- thank you for the love of the great holy donkey. Another reason to bless this actor's house for seven generations. God, I hate the, the, you know, and they just keep bri- the, this oh, bureaucrat who goes insane, bureaucrat who dis- who th- who's threatens to destroy the world because he's too, it's bureaucrat and or scientist who's going to destroy the world because he or he or she is too obsessed with his or her own project or uh, the smooth running of their base. <laughs> Uh, the the bureaucrat who refuses to believe the doctor, the bureaucrat who who insists that the doctor Please. is the actual threat, the doctor is the person causing the problem. We get the sonic point. Move on. But may I interject with this one? On the defense, on Commandant, uh, played by uh, Colin Gordon. Here. Thing. Um, my point was that. From his point of view, he's not an overly eccentric guy. He makes logical sense, and he's actually doing his job decently, opposed to all the other guys that are in charge that we've seen thus far. Thoughts? Opinions? Yes, I, though, 
I have uh, written a Facebook status myself <coughs> um, defending, well, not defending, but yes, accepting the fact that the sceptical bureaucrat uh, archetype in the Troughton era of Doctor Who is logical, it's rational, it makes perfect sense. If a strange man suddenly appears in a blue poli in a blue wooden police box at your top secret facility, the last thing you're going to believe is that fuzzy pink aliens are trying to take over people's brains. Uh, <clears throat> but my yeah, problem I... is the fact that not so much in this serial, yes, because uh, not Inspector Gascoigne, that he was the one who was murdered, but the other inspector played by the actor who played Saladin, you know, that he mitigates this. He balances it. But when you get to the end of... Uh, end of the Victoria era, beginning of the Zoe era, with um, uh, Fury from the Deep and The Wheel in Space, two serials, back-to-back, -back, exactly the same fucking character, exactly the same fucking feeble attempt to... Uh, um, raise the tension by oh the doctor knows how to save the day but the bureaucrat isn't going to let him save the day oh will he be able to save the day in time you well, it's a cliffhanger yeah. no it's not it's no it was a cliffhanger the first 73 times we saw it now it's just ripping the piss when, when you get to Fury in the Deep Will in Space, and especially Inferno, you know, variety, yeah. originality, you've done this plot point, move on. <laughs> I think perhaps that's quite unique to those of us watching uh, Doctor Who in sequence, because uh, obviously when I, for example, when I first saw uh, Inferno, um, I hadn't necessarily seen all of these, so it, it's but yeah, I mean, going in order. But then the the people who saw this uh, in the sequence saw it, um, you know, tw twenty odd minutes a week. And yeah. Yes, it, admittedly yeah. at the time it was years apart. But me watching all of Doctor Who as uh, straight from classic Doctor Who beginning to end back to back in two months. Yes, by the time uh, Wheel in Space and Inferno came around, I was ready to kill someone. <laughs> yeah. Keep in mind the period. I mean, you're not going to watch T Doctor Who every week. It was more of a thing that you managed to spot on if you had the right, you know, managed to find the, uh, uh, what do you guys, the Daily, uh, the Radio Times equivalent where you'd open to a... Radio Times? Yeah, yeah, yeah you'd open up the Radio Times, you would look at the schedule and be like, okay, I have to remember to come back home and watch Doctor Who after, you know, whatever. You'd have to remember. Well, I am accepting this point. I am not saying that if you watched it one, 20 minutes a week over the course of several years, I am uh, all out of sequence. It's still irritated. I am just saying that. No, I agree. Yeah, years... if, if you're that familiar with the, with the, the plot, it means you're right. I'm, yeah, yeah I'm not, it's. Just, yeah. I understand. Uh, I, I, it's serverless. It's it's the equivalent of uh, Blake Seven. It's, it, it's all an evil trap set by Serverland. She wins, she survives, and she comes back the next bloody week. We get it. We know what. What else have you got? Basically, you know. Um, when a writer starts doing the same thing, not every bloody, you know, not, it, it was the case in uh, Doctor Who, the, bringing back the master every week. What, do you have some sort of genetic defect which means you are fatally allergic to originality? <laughs> can't you just create one other character? <laughs> what, can't you just create one other plot point? Yes, in the earlier serials, such as the Moon Base, Tenth Planet, and here, the Faceless Ones, they've managed to add some kind of balance to it. But, uh, again, with Wheel in Space, um, 
Fury from the Deep, and then Inferno, when the entire problem is almost literally, we know what the we know what the problem is, we know what the solution is, we know how to save the world, but the bureaucrat slash scientist in charge is a fucking fuck nugget. Uh, that, <coughs> That why is it st- why is it still dragging on for f- for four weeks or six weeks, depending on the length of the serial? <laughs> uh, uh, well, we've all... yeah. I don't know. I totally so... don't even see it that way. Like the Doctor Who writers at the time, like they did. Yeah, it's going back to old ground. But what else can you do with Ben and Polly by uh, throwing Polly into the other side, kind of like? Oh, Ben was in the other episode where he jumped ship. Again, again we're not talking about yeah. uh, this one. Again, we're not talking no, about this one particular it's, series. Yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. it's when you when you ex- when you accept the fact that aside from the fact that one is set in space and the other set in an oil rig, uh, uh, Fury from the Deep and Wheel and Wheel in Space are basically the same fucking serial. <laughs> You know, one has Cybermen, the other has Killer Seaweed. That's it. <laughs> you know, um, and, and the fact that both of them are back to back. It's. I think it's the fact that I'm a writer myself. I don't know if you're a writer, Ben, but um, no, I this, I write. This, but... uh, this is why it. This is why it irks me so much to see. Um, Lay what what's it, what is literally lazy writing? Okay, you've used this plot point to good effect in the past, but now you're using it as a crutch. Okay, uh, and when, the when of David Ells and Malcolm Duck who wrote the script, at least they switched up a few things, and if they can't come up with an idea, at least have a standing point because writing is hard. It's true. It's it's, it's yeah. absolutely true. I wouldn't be a, I wouldn't be able to uh, write for Doctor. I, it, no, but it's um, I would be a, I wouldn't be able to write for Doctor Who every week or every series, for example, because I'm just yeah, not a yeah. writer. But yeah. there, you don't having the same two fucking serials back to back. And come on, there are other serials. There are other plot Wait. points. There are other archetypes. Come on, you don't uh, have we, to. We, we... We have laboured over the same point uh, for over eight minutes now. Yes, um, Ben, basically, you're yeah. just saying, uh, oh, it's, you're wrong to hate it. Just it's, like it. Come on. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 ben mentioned how, uh, the chari- uh, how the writer Malcolm Hulk is now introduced. I do believe this yep. is Malcolm Hulk's first. Malcolm Hulk... Uh, will go on to write and co-write uh, some uh, fantastic Doctor Who uh, when he teams up with uh, Terence Dix. Oh, yes. I don't um, think... the, the War Games. Yeah. By far one of the uh, greatest serials, Doctor Who serials of all time. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, well, well, but as I say, in this case, uh, uh, again... The, the faceless ones, yes, the the sceptical uh, commandant in this one was realistic, and it was effectively, um, <coughs> and it was effectively counterbalanced by Detective Inspector Saladin. <coughs> yep. But can't argue with that. Yeah. <sighs> um. But uh, okay, Ben, uh, were you finished with your your overall uh, appraisal of the serial? The reason that I really like it is it just feels authentic. Rarely in Doctor Who do you actually go in thinking that everyone in the background is going to take you, like, not seriously. Because usually when the Doctor comes to town, everyone's like, oh, my God, it's amazing. The Doctor, he knows everything. But even the girl from Blackpool is kind of like, who's this Doctor below? Like, it's more interesting with character dynamics and background characters where the whole passport idea comes up. We've never seen that in Doctor Who before. At least I haven't. Um, No, I don't think he's ever been asked for his passport. You've never seen someone walk up to the doctor and be like, hey, where's your passport? Where's your identification? In a way where it's, like, official. That a new series, he's got the psychic paper. Right, but in this one, he doesn't. (laughs) 
In classic Who, no, you're absolutely right, he doesn't. Um, yep. I'm trying to think. Well, we'll, we'll see as we uh, as we go yeah. through them. Yeah, so in, uh, it's amazing. Later in on the, tra- the, the Trouser the era, the sonic screwdriver yeah. is used to drive screws. It's scary. But go ahead, Ben. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think the way that the Commandant and the Inspector work together, and then the way the Doctor initially over time wins over the inspector to the commandant's point of view and it's done in a way where it feels logical and it feels realistic don't mind the uh sounds outside but um yeah i just i really like it oh god you've just made me realize that this uh, that, that this is how troughton was laying the groundwork for the pertwee era <laughs> <laughs> Which, again, you take something that works, you take a good idea, and then plough it into the ground. <clears throat> but, yes, um, I, I agree that the, back, the background characters and so forth were all excellently done. As I explained in my uh, Facebook uh, status discussing uh, the, the trout this kind of Troughton, the Troughton era, this kind of issue with Troughton. I think one of the main reasons why um, Pertwee was a uh, unit scientific advisor was that the Brigadier could just stop any stupid questions by saying, he's with me, shut up. <laughs> right, this is <clears throat> but, where the Doctor has to do with all this, um, as you said before, deal with all these um, people in charge and, yeah. you know, we did meet the Brigadier earlier on, though, so he'll be coming back. No, no. Uh, uh, well, we haven't met. We haven't met Colonel Leftwich Stewart yet. Oh, right. Actually. We haven't. Yes. Right. We still yes. get that. Uh, we've met uh, later Brigadier uh, Al- uh, Alistair Leftwich Stewart's uh, great, 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 great to the power of ten. Red <laughs> fire. Red fire. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yes. It's, it's just, oh, the, the problem with any long-running series when the writers are naturally uh, running out of um, ideas, when, <laughs> when you take a good plot, plot point, trope, uh, archetype, character, or what have you that worked, and then plough it into the ground. <laughs> you know, when it jumps yeah. the shark, to use the American term, when it when it just becomes a uh, self-referencing parody of its true self. <clears throat> Not mentioned. The and uh, <laughs> go ahead, Ben. <laughs> no, and also, um, since this is the end of Ben and Polly, the the writers are finally freed up for the next ep- next episode or the next uh, serial to actually go out and do things, and we'll find out next week. But this is, for me, this is a sad farewell for uh, me, because this is the end of the only, the only Pen and Doctor Who. <laughs> Not the best written time. <laughs> the only the Pen only... in Doctor Who, you said. You were tearing up there at the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, there's never... There has never been a companion called Alex. Oh, although... Mm. Um, in the in the wider universe, mm. um, uh, the Doctor's great grandson is uh, Alexander Campbell. Yep, which is what I'm called. Well, I'm Alexander Campbell Wiley, but you know. Yeah. Hey. So, well, actually, that's uh, is that the Unbound universe or is that the regular universe? Uh, I know it's in Big Finish. Oh, okay. Yeah, I. So. I'm pretty sure, yeah, there is a serial where the Doctor actually has, like, a legitimate, like, thing, but, yeah. Yes, we apologize for this nerdy interruption in your regular scheduled broadcast. Normal services will resume shortly. (laughs) Oh, yeah. But, I mean, even their leaving was just kind of surreal. Because the whole, you know, chameleons, and they have to kill the fake Jamie, and... Who's who is the real Jamie and and also it was kind of surreal that Ben and Polly realized oh wait it's only been like a couple of weeks since we left the TARDIS it's, but no, really, it's exactly it's exactly the, the same year. day exactly yeah. the same day. day 
Yes, th that is the entire point. Come on, princess, if we, a duchess, should I say, if we may, if we rush, we can catch a bus and I can still catch my ship. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, th that's, so. that's an odd thing about this. This happens on the same day that the war machines happen. Yep. Uh, uh, and then uh, goes directly into Evil of the Daleks. So there are three Doctor Who stories that happen on on twenty uh, the twentieth of July, July nineteen sixty six. Yeah, so bu busy year for the Doctor. Yeah. Or yeah, a busy day for the Doctor. <laughs> so yeah, so busy day for the Doctor. So my question is, how come that it well. I know later on they're going to do three Doctors and stuff, but was there ever a possibility in the back of the writers' heads of actually doing a uh, crossover? Yeah, it never it never occurred to their linear little uh, linear little minds not realizing that uh, time is actually a big ball of wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. Uh, oh, oh, obviously William Hartnell not terribly well. So by the time they did do it, you know, he had to be yeah. sat down, he had to have boards to read the lines off of. I mean, they rewrote the three Doctors around his health problems. Um, no, I'm just physics. saying, this yeah. is, the year is 19... When they made this, this is 1967. So, theoretically, if they really wanted to, they could throw a Hartnell episode in here just to make confuse everybody. Or just like, but, but as I hey, yeah. but as I say though, they it never it never would have occurred to them. You know, I this is the third time with me. What this is my third time watching this serial in mm -hmm. sequence from mm -hmm. uh, every episode of every serial from beginning to end, and I didn't realize that. Hey, it what so William Hartnell's Doctor and Patrick Troughton's Doctor are on opposite sides, different part are in different parts of London at the exact same time, fighting evil on the exact same day. Until you mentioned it, so uh, it's ah. it's completely understandable that the the, um, the 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 writers wouldn't have considered it either. Uh, the only thing that I'm really pissed off about is that we didn't see uh, Ian and Barbara during the Christmas episode in the middle yeah, of the, in yeah, the, in the, yeah. the Dalek Master Plan. That would have just been so perfect. <laughs> it was begging for it. <laughs> it was. Um, as some people think that um, uh, that. Uh, sorry, I've lost my thought. Hang on. Sorry. <laughs> um, damn it. What was I thinking? Some people think that um, uh, the the faceless ones should have been a recurring monster that we should have seen, or not monster, but creature, alien, uh, an alien that should have been seen since, uh, or that. Sh yeah. I completely disagree with that because it's like the Monoptera in uh, the web planet they were um they they were created for that specific story the whole point is that they came to earth because a disaster on their own planet left them dying without identity literally without faces so um their scientists came up with a way for them to steal the identities of humans and thus survive. To which uh, the Doctor show convinces them that no, you can't simply uh, miniaturise people and steal their identities. You can't uh, take over the Earth this way or just take over this part of humanity. You have to find another way to to uh, save your people and uh, I do believe the Doctor actually offers to help with that uh, uh, to find another technology, another means of saving them, for the species to save themselves. So it's not that they're malevolent, it's not that they're evil, uh, it's not that um, <clears throat> it's not that they have any particular goal beyond survival it's just that the director, the, director the, the leader of this surviving group of 
faceless ones, uh, convinced them that, yes, humans are lower than animals on our own planet, so there's nothing wrong in uh, miniaturizing them uh, and stealing their identities. Uh, we are the superior life forms. Uh, the, the doctor convin then convinced them otherwise, to wit, they go off, uh, presumably develop the technology they need to survive and live peacefully on their new colony, planet, homeworld, what have you, uh, with uh, no more problems. It's the, it's the same as with the web planet. The only problem was the animus. The animus, I have to pronounce it properly, or whilst flapping my arms up and down. <laughs> so once that was gone, the Monoptera returned to their simple, peaceful life, and uh, so did the Optra, and the Zabi, and the Zabi Lava. So uh, uh, the idea of being a recurring villain, a recurring uh, monster, or what have you, just does not fit at all, in my, in my humble opinion. <sighs> Well, even if they had later on, like, let's just say they had a family of the faceless woman, a third doctor, a fourth doctor, it just would feel weird. Yeah, um, uh, it would feel it would feel weird, and also there would be no real point to it, as I say, and as, uh, it's it's the same kind of. Uh, there would be no reason for them to come back. There, there is no continuing threat. They're not out for revenge. They're not looking. They're not t trying to kill all humans so that they've that uh, uh, because they've determined that humans are a threat to moon base. Uh, they're not uh, looking for strategic advantages in their never-ending war against the Rutians, Sontarans. <laughs> you know, uh, they're not Zygons. Uh, uh, they're not it's, warriors. Exactly. They're just, it, they're just people who uh, are trying to survive and now uh, hope presumably the Doctor has helped them develop a way to survive. End of story. <laughs> uh -huh, okay, I'm going to open up the floor if anyone has any more comments to add. Um, um, go ahead, Ben. Oh, thanks. Um, I think... If you want to talk about plot for a second and just kind of, yeah, we know it's it's being around the bush. I just think it's kind of like a, a nice little nod in the beginning to have a chameleon tours and then being doppelgangers, you know, a little cheeky. Uh, little, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a chameleon tour. That's not a nod. <laughs> More of a that, giant that's shape. not a nod. That's calling the villain Mr. Evil Murdering Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. yes, uh, the fact that it well, no, I just want to go back to the fact. And that there's, all, there's a missing plot point before you jump. Um, we never find out what happens to um, the Liverpoolian's uh, brother. Oh, we we no no. Mm. Uh, we, no uh, it, your brother will be back in a minute. He's just one of the teenage young people who's demilitarized on the satellite and brought down uh, uh, in the plane. It's never shown though. Sorry. It's never really shown. Like it's explained, but it's like there's no reuniting. We just hope that the doctor says what he means versus well it's them. it's it's like uh the assumption that yes the faceless ones will never will live happily ever after we uh yeah. maybe it's the fact that uh we maybe it's the fact uh, that i'm just more used to korean and japanese cinema where not everything has to be explained and wrapped up uh, so, so obviously at the end of every episode, you know, I'm uh, re-watching yeah. Star Trek Voyager, for example, uh, and just the way that they feel compelled to explain absolutely everything. We get it! If you drop a hammer on a... If you drop a hammer, you don't have to see it hit the floor to know that it hits the floor. <laughs> Unless... Yeah, um, you gotta... <laughs> well, I've, I've seen both, but I'm just used to like watching television shows where they kind of over-explain, so this is kind of nice where they don't explain too much, but I don't know, I just, because if she was really meant to be a companion, I expected there to be a scene where, like, 
her brother's back she's holding it. It's like, okay, oh, that, Dr. Rob. But that's, but that's the thing, though. They'd already yeah. realized that Pauline Collins wasn't going to be the companion. So uh, they just have this kind of non-ending. It was, it was yeah. blindingly obvious to me. Uh, I, well, first time I watched this, companion senses tingling, tingling like crazy. Okay, it's 1966. Yeah. I didn't realize that it was the same day in 1966. But Ben and Polly are going to leave as soon as they're uh, re-enlarged, demiliturized. Yeah. Um, either Jamie and Sheila are going to be the new companions or Jamie and Sheila are going to uh, stay together and live happily ever after, and the Doctor's going to go off on his own. Uh, but because uh, it, you know Sheila was going to be the new companion, they were obviously seeing a, a love interest between them, uh, like a, a la uh, Ben and Polly, only more blatant. <clears throat> but... Uh, because uh, the actress who played Sheila Briggs, Pauline Collins, uh, just said, no, she wasn't going to sign the contract. She was only going to do one serial. At the end, they had to go throw together this kind of uh, half assed oh, your brother's going to be here in a, bit, in a minute, and a sad uh, thousand-yard stare as, he st- as she stands there look- longing for the man who could have been... <laughs> As, yeah. Uh, as uh, he, as uh, Jamie and the Doctor chase after the TARDIS, which uh, we'll deal with in the next episode, where they're actually still in 1966, still trying to follow that freaking TARDIS. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I don't know. This is it, all Second Doctor feels like it's all. One big continuity, which is really nice, versus what we're used to in the new series where, you know, there's missing things. Uh, As I said before we recorded, uh, or was it during the podcast, um, the Tom Baker's first first uh, series, first year as the Doctor, aside from a bit of cheesiness and a bit of King Kong slash Frankenstein rubbish in Robot, was so was so magnificent was the greatest year of doctor who partly because it was uh one continuing storyline you know not even traveling in the tardis for most of it <laughs> right uh, and uh, this uh, whole the beginning like the death of polly and ben as characters well they don't die but they leave is the birth of that continuous. The idea of having everything in continuously mm. is the birth yes, uh, right around here. Again, uh, uh, although we have discussed in previous podcasts the uh, mm. or in previous conversations the fact that there are stories happening in between episodes. But no, as you say... Uh, but no, as you say, it, w- watching all of the uh, second and third Troughton uh, serials in order, or even the first, and even going back to Hartnell, um, the the idea that it, it is all one continuous thing from one to the next, with the constant cliffhangers leading you into the next story and the next story and the next story. It all works so well, as opposed to, as you say, the new series where each week it's okay, what the fuck is it going to be this time? Whatever it's going to be, there's go- we know that there's going to be a lot of Clara Rama. <laughs> yeah, but this, like, People didn't even get to watch this in the United States through, through only through the VHS, which is a really good documentary called The Daleks, The Early Years, and I saw a bit of that. And uh, when Americans saw this, this was bits and pieces distorted. Parts of it were shown. Um, as soon as it was aired, there's only been um, f- fragments of one, two, and three, and mo- most of it's just stills. So the original people who watched it had a lot more um, put it a lot more actual scenes versus the people that were watching it now, you know. Yes, uh, that is a good point. But although th- this is one of the uh, g- great things about classic Doctor Who, although it is continuous, each individual serial is for the most part standalone. 
you don't have to, you know, although there are ref, little joking references back to things that happened in the past you in previous serials you don't have to watch it all in order in order to get the full in order to get the full enjoyment of the serial itself of course you in order to get the full enjoyment of Doctor Who, even though uh, so much of it is reconstructed. Damn you, BBC Archive Department! Uh, yeah, even, even though so much of it is reconstructed now, in the age of the internet, we can watch it from beginning to end as long as the bloody BBC doesn't keep DMCAing it every time somebody puts it up. <laughs> Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, can I say actually? Because I was thinking uh, the other night, I I, I couldn't sleep because uh, I do suffer from insomnia. Uh, the Ben and Polly era. Um, yeah, I don't think there's ever a point where these people could have slept or showered or taken a shit or anything. Oh, uh, you're forgetting the macro terror. Apart from that, but I mean, <laughs> there's no, there's no in between stories. There's no. Oh, they do sleep. Yes, they have hypnotic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they have post hypnotic suggestion sleep uh, in the Macro Terror. Other than that, it's more continuous even than the first couple of seasons, which are fairly co continuous, where they don't change their clothes. Um, <laughs> uh, ben and Polly. Uh, did Ben and Polly even have rooms on board the Tardis? And how much sweat, how much... Uh, oh, are we losing Ben? Yeah, because I'm just thinking, because that, that, I could get very uncomfortable. Oh, and that's the thing, though. We never... Babylon 5 is the only science fiction series when we see men... In, when we see the cast using the toilet. Uh -huh. Using the bathroom. We, we never... We we very rarely see uh, the Enterprise crews or Voyager crews sleep. We never see where they take a shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Boy Babylon Five is the only science fiction series where we see people take a shower. <laughs> but um, oh, Voyager had showers that weren't really showers. Yes. Oh, the Sonic the Sonic showers. Yes. Uh, yeah. But we don't actually see them actually cleaning. We see uh, Torres starting to clean herself in one episode with her with her underwear on still. Uh, <laughs> but uh, ah, but yeah. no, um, but uh, no. I think this is part of the progression which we've talked about in previous in previous podcasts. How the Doctor used to be a grumpy explorer, travelling to different points of time, only really sticking his head out of the TARDIS or getting involved in things if it was of interest to him. And as mm. a result, each week, uh, <clears throat> each serial having to come up with uh, new and uh, ever more elaborate reasons why they had to stay and deal with the problem and couldn't simply run back into the TARDIS. Uh, so the fact that it was uh, with Ian, Barbara and Susan particularly, it was more of uh, a family, almost a sitcom, really. Uh, uh, they were almost a sitcom family, so yes, a lot of it was set in the TARDIS. It was the family bickering with uh, husband, wife, daughter, and grumpy old grandpa arguing over this and that. But now, though, it is more an adventure story with the Doctor staying and staying even though they can run back into the TARDIS because there's evil to be fought. <laughs> you know, it, uh, as I said in the previous podcast, you know, it, the Patrick Troughton era is where the idea of the Doctor as a hero really begins to develop with uh, uh, him just... Ha the, 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 the plot point of him just happening to arrive uh, at the right... or the wrong place at the wrong time is um, has always been part of Doctor Who, but now he, he is the man who saves the day. 
So, yes, uh, all of the domestic stuff which we saw during the Hartnell era is put aside along with Verity Lambert's original vision of the Doctor as a grumpy old grandfatherly explorer. Uh, to be replaced with more of the action man who goes chasing after the TARDIS. <laughs> I hope that I hope that all made sense. I'm thinking of writing a short doctoral thesis about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I would point out uh, without wanting to go on a tangent, but they bring back the domestic a- uh, aspect more in the 80s. Um, oh yes, you uh, see, you see their rooms in the 80s. Oh yes, indeed, uh, that is. Uh, because it's more of a family, um, it's again, it's more of a family setting than the doc, the doctor as kind of the parental figure with Nissa and Tegan as the big sisters and Adric as the little brother. So uh, yeah. That, yeah, so again, that kind of domestic setting works. But again, returning to the Troughton era, it's an adventure series. So yeah. uh, you know, the domestic stuff, there, there's no time or need for it, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, some people refer to the Davison era as neighbours with Roundels. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, well, uh, try, spending three years trying to get a man with the Australian back to Heathrow Airport, of course <laughs> the neighbours uh, comparison it, is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, but yeah, the, the soap opera. Maybe that's what point, uh, puts Ben off, is that the Davison era was, was a bit soap opera-ish. Yeah. Um, do we still have Ben? Oh, I, I think he had to unplug yeah, his speech. Yeah, final thoughts. Hello? Yeah, I, th- he sa- I think he said yes. Are we ready for final thoughts now? Uh, yes, I do. I do owe you some uh, massive shakings. I think I'm going to estimate five shakes. So, <laughs> is uh, that me or Ben or both of us? Both of you, and uh, yeah, a bit delayed. And um, right, uh, well, uh, can we go? Can we go high point, low point? Where actually, I don't know what my high point is. Um, actually, I'm going to cheat. Uh, instead of high point, low point, I'm going to say um, one of the miniaturised people runs an antique shop in Walthamstow around the corner from me. <laughs> After he's been demiliturised, obviously, or she. 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 Um, and uh, Ben, your high point, low point. Uh, high point was seeing Jamie. Oh, eh, eh. Ah, right. Um, high point, I guess, would be the doctor finally finding an even match with uh, the inspector and kind of being very logical. Low point was kind of Jamie flirting for random reasons. Aha, <laughs> uh-huh. and James. It's very difficult to say. I, I, <coughs> as much as I've talked in this serial, I don't think I've really talked... <laughs> uh, as much as I've talked in this podcast, I don't think I've really talked about the serial at all. But, um, yes, just to go back to my never-ending bitching about this one damn plot point, the low point is a is the Commandant being a sceptical bastard and the high point is the detective is detective inspector saladin coming in and slapping him down no let's <laughs> no let's uh, hear this man out let's listen to what he has to say ha 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 aha okay well let's go round and have um uh ben if you could uh, do Whatever sign off you wish. Ben, don't go! Ben Murray, no! I agree. <laughs> and James? Uh, yes, um, as much as it's a shame that Sheila Briggs wasn't a companion, and it would have been nice for Jamie to live happily ever after in 1966, I am so 
so looking forward to seeing Victoria in the next serial. And may what what's the name of the actress who plays Victoria? Uh oh, hang on. Deb uh, Deborah Watling. Deborah. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's like the time I woke up at two o'clock in the morning, terrified the living shit out of Teresa screaming, Charlton Heston! But <laughs> yeah, Deborah Watling, and interestingly, her father is also in Doctor Who, but we'll come back to that. Carry yes, on. and may the great holy donkey bless Deborah Watling's house for seven generations. I am also looking forward to uh, to the well the Jamie and Victoria era. Oh Doctor yes, uh, Jamie and Victoria. Oh yeah, yeah. The, that is my dream team. Damn you, Ian! To the blackest pits of hell. How dare you say that Victoria is si- is a silly companion or whatever term you used. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yes, and I can He's tell awesome. everybody. <laughs> I I can tell everyone that uh, Deborah Watling is absolutely uh, lovely in real life. Um, <laughs> there's James. Uh, but anyway, she's on doctor, that. She's one of my Doctor Who crushes, should I say? <laughs> oh. So yes. So well, next week we'll be meeting Victoria the Victorian in uh, a fantastic epic serial called The Evil of the Daleks. (laughs) 